Is that any different? <laughs> uh, optimal nutrition is the medicine of the future. Pharmaceutical medicine is running out of ideas. Antibiotics will soon be, according to many people, useless because of superbugs now developing resistance to the antibiotics. So we've got to look at other, va- other places. So optimal nutrition is the medicine of the future. When we talk about nutrition, I'm going to divide it into two sections. We've got macronutrition and we've got micronutrition. So two different nutrition. I'm going to go through these in a minute. When we talk about macro nutrition, we're talking about things called protein, fat, and carbohydrates. That's macro nutrition, okay? Those are the things that we find in every article of food. A bit of protein, a bit of fat, a bit of carbohydrate. Do we have to worry about these in Australia? Do you think we have to worry if we get enough protein in Australia? Or fat? Or carbohydrate? I see some saying yes, I see some saying no. Well, let's have a look at protein then. In fact, the average Westerner, including Australia, and America is no different here, this is a statistic from US, the average US adult consumes over 100 grams of dietary protein per day, nearly twice as much as recommended. We're eating too much protein. Don't think we're not eating enough. Too much. We've got to lay down. You just drive down the shop, fast food, you just don't even get out of the car and you just get handed lumps of protein, okay? You're never going to be starving in this country for protein. It's everywhere. In fact, we're eating far too much of it. And not only are we eating far too much protein, we're eating the wrong type of protein. We're eating far too much quantities of animal protein. Animal-based protein. And a lot of people have, are, are taxing the, their kidneys. Because the kidney does not like excess protein in the body. It has the one has to deal with most of it. And so a lot of people are having uh, the kidney trouble simply because they're having far too much protein. I mean, protein is only one thing. They're having far too much of everything. Now, when we talk about protein, animal protein versus plant protein, what's the best? You see, animal protein, though, like if you take uh, whey protein, which comes from the cow's milk, that's one of the best proteins in the world. Casein, another protein that comes from the cow's milk, that's one of the worst proteins in the world. So, some animal proteins are, are absorbed very quickly and metabolized in the body very quickly, like whey protein, for example. That's why you'll find bodybuilders use them a lot. But, we don't want protein that's going to build as quickly. You see, that's alright if you're a baby cow, right? If you're a little calf, you want mummy's milk to build you quickly, right? A little calf just goes, whoo! But do we go like that? We are one of the slowest developing creatures on the planet. We just baby steps all the way. We don't want to just blow up like a balloon after three months. When we talk about protein, we want to talk about quality, not quantity so much. The concept of quality really means the efficiency with which food proteins are used to promote growth. This would be well and good if the greatest efficiency equal to the greatest health, but it doesn't, and that's why the terms efficiency and quality are misleading. There is compelling research now to show that low-quality plant protein, which allows for slow, steady synthesis of new proteins, is the highest quality of protein. Slow but steady wins the race. A bit like the hare and the turtle, okay? We want the turtle protein. We don't want the hare protein. Because what happens is animal protein speeds up the body's... uh, replication system of DNA. Now, if you're doing something fast, what are you going to prone to do? Make a mistake, okay? And a mistake can be cancer, okay? We want to take it nice and easy, steady. We just take our time, do it right, you see? So we want plant-based protein. Let's have a look at plant-based protein. Have we heard of soya? Good or bad? (laughs) Depends. Depends. What statement comes up in Google first? Okay? <laughs> uh, I'll talk a little bit about soy as we go through, but this one I just want to look at as a protein. It's an excellent source of protein because it contains all the essential amino acids in the one bean. Essential means the ones you have to get from the diet. Non-essential protein is the one the body can make. So you don't need to eat it. The body will make it. But there's 
proteins the body cannot make and it needs to get them from the food. And the soya bean provides all the necessary ingredients to make them. Okay? Amino acid profile of the soya bean is uh, unusually complete for a plant protein. There's not many protein. plant-based diet, we don't just have a plate of soybeans, do we? I mean, what if I have a, a plate of bolotti beans? Now, the, in the bolotti bean, it's not every protein, amino acid in the bolotti bean. But what do I usually have with beans? I would have maybe some rice. And in the rice, it's not all the proteins either. But when I have what the beans missing, the rice has got. And what the rice is missing, the beans have got. So when I eat beans and rice, it's a complete protein. Okay? It's just like if I have a, a piece of bread, doesn't have all the protein. Peanut butter doesn't have all the protein. But when I have a piece of peanut butter, <laughs> you see, so combinations alleviate protein problems. Today, legumes are the main are a mainstay of most diets around the world. They are second only to grains in supplying calories and protein to the world's population. So the majority of the world live off of protein from legumes and grains, not animal. Compared with grains, legumes supply about the same number of total calories per serving, but they usually provide two to four times as much protein. So legumes, so we're talking lentils, chickpeas, all the beans, they're the ones in the soybean, they're the ones that give you the best plant-based protein, okay? Now, that's just a quick overview of protein. We've got to get through a lot of material here. Fats is another macronutrient. Do we need to worry about fat in our diet? You think we're going to get all skinny? Are anybody skinny here? Too skinny? I'm too skinny? No? no? I used to be. Before, I was going to say before I get married, but I better not say that. Before, before I stopped doing carpentry. I was doing carpentry, I used to be skinny. Fats. What's the problem with fats? The problem is fats, we eat too much. And we eat too much of the wrong kind. Too much animal fat and too much omega-6 fat. Okay? Now, when we talk about fats, fats on themselves are normally not a problem to the body. It's when they're damaged or oxidized. Okay? It's when we fry them, when we barbecue them, when we do some damage to them, when we process them and leave them on the shelf for 6 to 12 months, 18 months, when we expose them to sunlight. When they get damaged in the environment they're in, that's when we run into problems with fat. Most fats are not damaging themselves if, we, if they were taken properly. So the view is consolidating now in science that as far as lipids or fats are concerned, oxidized or damaged fats, rancid fat, and oxidized cholesterol are the real culprits of atherosclerosis, which is heart disease. Now, there was a controversy not so long ago about cholesterol. Did you hear about it? Some researchers were saying nothing wrong with cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the problem for heart disease. All this cholesterol-lowering drugs is a money-making racket. Did you hear that? Yeah, personally, I agree with that. Because 80% of the cholesterol is made by your liver. And the liver doesn't make something that's not good for you. Alright, you only get 20% of cholesterol from the diet. And it's when, but it's when that cholesterol is damaged and destroyed in the presence of inflammation in the body, that's when it becomes problematic. It can stick and plaque the artery, okay? In other words, it's free-flowing because your liver makes it. Man, imagine your liver, if you didn't eat any animal product... Your liver's producing cholesterol. Is the liver going to give you a heart disease? No. It's not going to happen, okay? So, the fresh fats or fresh cholesterol is not a problem. It's the damaged one. So, the mere presence of fat and cholesterol is not the big problem, but rather the degree to which they are oxidized or damaged. In addition to oxidized fats that we may consume, the unsaturated fat and cholesterol inside our bodies can be oxidized if there are many free radicals combined with a deficiency of antioxidants like vitamin A, C and E. So what it's saying here is, yes, the liver makes 80% of our cholesterol, but that cholesterol is pure when the liver makes it, but it can be destroyed in the body by chemical exposure that we take in, or we are deficient in nutrients to protect antioxidants like vitamin C, A or E. And if we, are, we haven't got enough of those micronutrients, and that's what micronutrients is, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytochemicals. Macro is protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And we need micronutrients because they protect the body against damage. Alright? And when we have 
a deficiency, and, and let me tell you, there's a lot of people deficient. Then we are in trouble. Now, omega-6. Have we heard of omega-3? we heard of omega-9? Yeah. Well, omega-6 is the most commonly used foods, especially for processing. Processed foods are manufactured with omega-6 oils for longer what? Okay, so it's not for your health, not for longer longevity. <laughs> it's not for longer vi- vibrancy. It's for longer what? Shelf life. So it's a manufacturing choice. It's not a nutrition choice. I'm going to pick that vegetable oil because it's going to make my food last longer. Chances I'll sell it then. If it's on the shelf for two years, well, I'm going to sell it. If it went off in two weeks, I'd have to be producing all the time. Chips and fries are soaked in soybean oil. Nothing wrong with the soybean, but if you're going to cook the oil again and again and again and again, there's something wrong with that. Omega-6s are essential as they are part of every cell membrane controlling what goes in and out of the cell. So it's a good oil. It's what we're doing with it is the problem. But without a correct balance of omega-3, more harm sits in. So if we have too much high omega-6 in ratio to omega-3, then we're going to tip the body into a wrong balance. Especially the, the wall around the cell. Because the wall or membrane around the cell brings in nutrients and chemicals in and out of the body. And that can be altered. When, the, when, that, when that fatty substances are altered in the cell, then we can have cellular problems and damage and disease. So omega-6... The cell membrane produces chemicals called cytokines that directly cause inflammation. So, omega-6 produces chemicals that actually increase inflammation in your body. Now, you don't want too much inflammation in your body, okay? You want reduced inflammation. Today's mainstream diet produces an imbalance from 15 to 1 as high as 30 to 1. So, they've got 30 times more omega-6 than omega-3. Does that make sense? This tremendous amount of cytokines causes inflammation, a ratio of 3 to 1. So we're talking tenfold difference here. Arachidonic acid, that's another type of fat. It comes from predominantly animal foods. When you eat animal foods, you'll get this omega-6 fatty acid. It also gets converted, it says acted upon by this enzyme cyclooxygenase in the body. It can be converted into what's called prostaglandin 2 and prostacyclin. These are pro-inflammatories. These are chemicals that increase inflammation in the body. Now remember, I'll give you a simple illustration. I've used this many times. If I twist my ankle, the body sends chemicals down there which inflames the area to protect it. But after about a little while, I've got some ice and (laughs) it's in a plaster cast. The body what? As it heals, it sends other chemicals down there to remove the inflammation. So the body can inflame and the body can anti-inflame. Does that make sense? Now, these oils here, how we eat and the food we eat can cause inflammation or can reduce inflammation. And heart disease is an inflammatory condition. It's it's your immune system, your inflammatory condition that will kill you. Heart disease. Have we heard of arthritis? What's that? Inflammatory. Irritable bowel syndrome? Inflammatory. There's many inflammatory conditions just caused by the wrong diet. Trans fats. Fats that have been manufactured and overheated and destroyed, chemically destroyed, heated at high temperatures and also pumped with hydrogen atoms to change the molecular structure. So you've got a bottle of olive oil at the shelf in the supermarket. Is it solid or liquid? Liquid. When you go to the fridge section, you've got olive oil margarine. Is it liquid or solid? So what happened to the olive oil? It was chemically changed to look like butter without destroying the bread when you try to spread it. Okay? But what happens is, that margarine has been touted by many people to say, get off butter and go on the margarine to reduce your chances for heart disease. Yeah? doesn't work that way. This study here, epidemiological study, found that people with a high intake of margarine have twice the risk of what? First heart attack compared with those low. It's a dangerous fat. The body does not like it. And I believe, you know, I believe studies will come to show it's carcinogenic. There's not much information on right now, but I think it's, it's certainly coming there. They're working towards it and they're showing how dangerous it is. Margarine, the best place for margarine is the bin. Okay? If I had the choice between margarine and butter, it would always be butter. It's a stable fat. It's a natural fat. Yes, it's saturated fat. It's got good saturated fat. It's got bad saturated fat. 
but it's better than margarine. Margarine's got nothing good in it. Okay? And they might add phytosterols to say it's cholesterol lowering. Yes, they add additives, synthetic additives to make it appear good. It's like having, it's like having a packet of peanuts and covered them with caramel and chocolate and calling it a Snickers bar and making it healthy. It doesn't work, does it? Trans fatty acids raise LDL cholesterol and they lower HDL. Is that what we want? No. So it has the opposite effect. It actually lowers what we would call the good cholesterol, which brings the cholesterol out of your body, and it raises what we would call the bad cholesterol, although it's not really bad, but we'll call it still bad, so you know what I mean. It raises the cholesterol, so it dumps more cholesterol into your cell. Okay? Now, if we look at this little chart here, omega-3 gets converted into linolenic acid, which can converts, then converts into EPA and DHA, then converts into anti-inflammatories called prostaglandin-3. That's why they say take omega-3, because it actually, what does it do? It reduces inflammation in the body. The body converts that oil into anti-inflammatory chemicals. That's a good thing. But if you have high levels of omega-6, it gets converted into linoleic acid. Arachidonic acid also comes down this line. It gets converted into pro-inflammatories, prostaglandin-2s, which increases inflammation. So your choice of oil will ch- will, can determine the level of inflammation in your body. So we want to balance. Now if you're looking for a plant-based source of omega-3, flaxseed or linseed oil or seed. Walnuts, if you look at a walnut, what does it look like? It looks like a brain. Remember it's good for your brain. Hemp seed oil, not hemp. Hemp is marijuana. Don't take the other part. But the seed very good. You can get it in the health food shop now, hemp seed oil. Chia seed also has some omega-3. So these are the olive oil, very good monosaturated fat, okay? Very good for uh, having an anti-inflammatory effect in the body. Now, we're eating too much protein, too much animal protein. We're eating too much fat, too much animal saturated fat, too much refined trans fat. What about carbohydrates? Carbohydrates is a chemical name for sugar. That's all it is. If you're like most Americans today, you're surrounded by fast food chain restaurants. You're barraged by ads for junk foods. You see other ads for weight loss programs that say that you can eat whatever you want, not exercise and still lose weight. It's easier to find a Snickers bar, a Big Mac or a Coke than it is to find an apple. And your kids eat at a school cafeteria whose idea of vegetable is the ketchup on the burger. Does that describe Western society? It's pretty close. Americans have been among the first people worldwide to have the luxury of bombarding themselves with nutrient-deficient, high-calorie, often called empty-calorie or junk food. By empty-calorie, I mean food that is deficient of nutrients and fiber. Now, we've just followed the same way. We're we're a Western country, and we have the same patterns as the United States. And we eat empty food. Not empty of calories, they're very high in calories, that means energy, but very low, and listen to me when I say this, very low, it says they're deficient, deficient in nutrients. But what kind of nutrients? They're not deficient in fat. They're not deficient in protein. They're not deficient in sugar. That's macronutrition. They're deficient in vitamins. They're deficient in minerals. They're deficient in antioxidants, phytoplant chemicals. They're deficient in the things that will protect us. That's what they're deficient in. They're deficient in fiber. That's why when you buy a, a, a burger and chips, why do they always give you a drink? You try and eat that burger and chips without a drink, and they'll be like, the M1 peak hour here, just can't get it down. You need to swallow it. Mm-hmm. There's no fiber. It just block you up. Unlike the fruits found in nature, which have a full assemble of nutrients, processed carbohydrates, such as bread, pasta, and cake. Now, I want to make this clear. Vegetarian, being a vegetarian does not make you healthy. Because I could eat bread, pasta, cakes, pizza, ice cream, Snickers, Coca-Cola, and I'm still a vegetarian. Yeah? 
Don't think because I'm a vegetarian I get rid of the meat. Oh, I'm going to be <laughs> wonderful now. It doesn't work like that. Right? It's not just getting rid of one thing and putting a, a veggie sausage in place. Right? There's a lot more to it than that. If I'm eating bread, now when I talk about bread, I'm talking about white bread. When I talk about pasta, I'm talking about white pasta. When I'm talking about cakes, I'm talking about white flour-based cakes and biscuits. When I'm talking about rice, it's white rice. Everything's white. Can you remember that? When you look at it, it's white. It's pure. It's like a virgin. There's nothing in it. Okay, it's, There's nothing. It's empty. Can you remember that? There's nothing in it. Why? Because we've removed it all through the process. There's no fiber, no plant nutrients have all been processed out. The vitamins have been dramatically reduced. Minerals as well have all been lost in the processing. Starchy white flour foods removed from nature's packaging are no longer real food. The fiber and the majority of minerals have been removed. Every time you eat such processed foods, you exclude from your diet not only essential nutrients that we're aware of, but hundreds of undiscovered phytonutrients that are critical for normal function of the human body. So, we talk about magnesium, we talk about potassium, we talk about vitamin C, we talk about vitamin E, we talk about selenium, we talk about iron. These are things we know. You take one tomato, there are over 10,000 plant chemicals in there. In one tomato. And we don't know what they are or what they do yet. All right? We know some things, but there's a lot of things we don't know. And let me tell you, you can't get what's in the tomato and put it in a multivitamin tablet either. Okay? The multivitamin t- tablet is not a tomato. If you look at the comparisons of white bread with wholemeal bread, this is what happens when you process white bread. 25% of the protein is missing. 95% of the fiber is missing. It forms golf, golf balls in the colon. Calcium, 56%. Iron, 84%. Phosphorus, 69 Look at all these high percentages. This is what's removed, okay? That's why when you see, have you seen white bread and they've got high fiber, they add fiber to it, high folate, they add folate to it, it's synthetic folate. You know, they wanted a campaign to increase the folate in women who are pregnant to stop uh, spina bifida and so forth. And the women were not eating their greens. Because folate comes from foliage, which is like silver beet, broccoli, but nobody was eating it. But guess what? All the pregnant ladies were having bread. Oh, just take it in their bread. But it's synthetic and there's nothing else in the bread for the baby. Nothing. Okay? Instead of getting onto the greens, we're manufacturing food. This is not real food, by the way. White bread, you know, have you heard of the glycemic index? That's the measurement of how quickly... When you eat a food, it raises the blood sugar level in the body. You know what they measured all foods against? White bread. Not sugar, white bread. They took white bread and then measured everything else. White bread is like an injection. Okay? It's sugar. Why is it we have so much bread and pasta? And cereals? Don't get me on cereals now. You remember this? You ever seen that? Used to be on cornflakes. <laughs> Cocoa Pops, Rice Babbles. Now, some people try and tell me this is a nutrition plan. This is a commercial plan. And it was pushed by all these companies here. Because you can't tell me that an apple is less nutritious than a bowl of pasta. You can't tell me that a broccoli is not as good for you as a loaf of bread. So why should I be having more bread and not enough broccoli? Okay? This is a commercial. It's not a nutritional pyramid. It's based, there are some nutrition points. I agree that up here should be hardly used at all. I agree with that. But these ones here are wrong way around. So when we talk about foods that don't have micronutrition, but they have high supplies of carbohydrates, high sugar foods, we're talking about white bread, white pasta, white rice, white sugar, refined cereals, cocoa pops, all the rest of it. Animal flesh foods and dairy foods, high protein, high fat. Now when you look at fast foods, if you go to a fast food restaurant, I won't call it a restaurant. What do you call it? Fast food. You call it restaurant? I don't really want to start naming McDonald's in Kentucky and all those ones, but we'll go to a fast food takeaway shop. You know what they're good in supplying? Lots of refined carbohydrate in the bun. Lots of 
animal protein in the burger. Lots of animal protein in the shake. Lots of sugar in the shake. Lots of sugar in the bun. Lots of saturated fat in the burger. Lots of saturated fat in the cheese. Lots of trans fat in the fries. You see what they're good at? And guess what? It all tastes pretty good. They wouldn't be making so much money. But what's it missing? Micronutrition. It's missing minerals and vitamins and antioxidants and phytochemicals that are going to keep us and protect us from disease. It might taste good, but they're only going to kill us. So when we look at high macro, when we look at foods that contain high levels of protein, carbohydrate and fats compared to vitamins, minerals and antioxidants, we're talking about foods like animal food, dairy food comes from the animal, and refined, white, processed foods. These are the bad area when it comes to nutrition. They're high in macro, but we don't need high in macro. They're low in micro. If we're looking at foods that are high in micro, high in vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytochemicals, and low to moderate, because some of these, like not some of them are high protein, some of them are high fat. And depends how you eat them. If you, if you roast it and kill it, or you cook it fresh, or eat it fresh, sorry, there's a big difference as well. So what we do with the food makes a big difference. It might be good until we destroy it. You know, if you, put a, if you get a raw carrot and you plant it in the ground, what will it do? Will it shoot and sprout? What happens if you boil it first for half an hour and put it in? What's it going to do? So, at one stage it was alive, yeah? And at other stage, it was dead. Does that make sense? Optimal nutrition is not about just what we eat. It's not just about eating the good stuff. It's also what we don't eat, avoiding the bad stuff. Does that make sense? Two roads there. Now, unfortunately for us, we live in a, a chemical world, a chemical environment. Optimal nutrition is not just about what you eat, it's what you do not eat is equally important. Since the 1950s, over 3,500 man-made chemicals have found their way into food. Okay? 3,500 chemicals have made their way into food we eat. And half of them are not labelled. Half of them we've got no idea what they mean. E16494, we've got no idea what that is. These include pesticides, antibiotics, hormone residues. They're all in the, in the food chain from stable foods such as grains and meat. Many of these chemicals are anti-nutrient in that they stop nutrients from being absorbed and used and promote their excretion. Do you understand that? So you might eat a good food, but if it's contaminated with pesticide or herbicide or antibiotic or hormone residue, those chemicals that come in with the food can actually cause your nutrients and vitamins and minerals to be excreted faster than they should. It can actually block them from being absorbed. So the good nutrients in the food you're eating, I'm eating good stuff. That chemical can stop it going through the digestive tract. So it goes right down the toilet. So you see, it's not just about eating the right food. We've got to have, make sure what food we have. The best food is organic food. Why? Because it's not treated with man-made chemicals, Okay. Nowadays in the United States alone we get through every year staggering 2 million tons of food chemicals. 119 billion alcoholic drinks, this is just in America. 375 billion cigarettes. you think there would be a cloud over the country or smoke. 400 million prescriptions for painkillers. 250 million prescriptions for antibiotics. 50,000 chemicals are released into the environment by industry and 500 million gallons of pesticide and herbicide are sprayed into the food and pasture. I mean, it's a wonder we're alive. Are we exposed to chemicals in this world? What do you think? Can you get away from chemicals? Unless you live in Alaska. <laughs> if you live in Australia, you're not going to get away from it completely, okay? Why? Because we eat it, we drink it, we breathe it, we wear it, we wash in it, we cover with it, we sleep in it, 
we live in, okay? So unless you're going to stop doing some of that, <laughs> we're going to get chemical exposure. But what we have to do, optimal nutrition is about making sure that our vitamin, minerals, antioxidants from the plant-based foods are high and that our exposure to chemicals, man-made, anything that man-made, by the way, in the food chain is problematic. All right? Anything that man tampers with is a problem. And when we start tampering with it, we want to, we want to lower our exposure to chemicals, okay? Are we wearing it? Whether I wash my... Well, I don't know what my wife washed them in, but it smells like something, okay? So she's put it in some chemical detergent, yeah? I've sprayed on some chemicals. I've put on some chemicals. I've washed my hair in chemicals. Of breathing in chemicals. Look at the fumes of the car. Where do they go? They go somewhere. Everything is chemical exposure. So we have to limit our exposure. It's estimated that environment and lifestyle can cause about 80% of cancer. So 80% of cancers are driven from how we live and where we live. That means they're, pre they're potentially preventable if we change what? How we live and where we live. Most cancers are primarily the result of changes that humans have made to the total chemical environment. What we eat, what we drink and what we breathe. According to one of Britain's top medical scientists, Sir Richard Dole, 90% of all cancers are caused by such environmental factors. At least 75% of all cancers are associated with environmental or lifestyle factors see even the most conservative uh, experts. So you're talking nearly 90% of cancers are caused by what is exposed to. Not all, of course, but 90%, some of them are saying, which is very high. Let's look at the top five cancers, lung, breast, stomach, colorectal, and prostate, or bowel there, prostate, where they were basically unheard of before the beginning of the 20th century. 100 years ago, these were unheard of. So what's happened in 100 years? We went from horse and cart to what? Push your back and push my guy even push your back. I can't even walk to there. I've got a remote. It's too much exercise. Technology, isn't it? Industrialization. The growth in the incident of cancer parallels with industrialization and chemicalization of the world. In other words, the more industrialized and chemicalized the country, a higher level of cancer. The more you live in the middle of whoop whoop, the less exposure and the less cancer rate. The more developed a country, the more prevalent in cancer, the higher the income per capita, the higher incidence of cancer. You think the United States of America, it's got all the money in the world, doesn't it? It's got all the technology in the world, and yet it's got the highest cancer rates in the world. You see, because it's also got the highest pollutants in the world. It's also got the highest man-made chemicals in the world. And they're in the food chain. You know, Australia is not as bad as the United States when it comes to interfering with the food market. We are, we are still blessed here very much because there's a lot of strict controls. So some things are still getting through, but for sure. But there's a lot of things that are banned here that are not banned over there or other countries, you know. What about meat? Denmark eats more meat per capita than any other nation in the world. So the Danes love their meat. What do they love the most? See, in Scotland, we used to get Danish bacon. Do you get it here? No? It's too far away from Denmark. In Scotland, we got flooded with Danish bacon. They love their pork. In fact, they are the highest consumers of pork in the world. They eat the most meat in the world per capita. They eat the highest levels of pork in the world. And they've got the highest level of cancer in the world. So animals are going to protect us against cancer? I don't think so. Breast cancer in the United States of America, one in seven women are at risk for breast cancer. You go to China, one in 100. That's a big difference. Huge difference. Prostate cancer for men, look at that, it's higher. Prostate cancer is more prevalent than breast cancer. One in six men, prostate cancer. You go to China, they haven't got statistics. It's hardly ever there. 
I think I'll move to China. Um, What's wrong? What's, uh, now, when we're talking about China, I'm not talking about Beijing and Shanghai. I'm talking about rural China. Out in the paddy fields, in the mountains and the valleys. All right? Rural country. We're not talking about city, because I believe if you did the city, it would come pretty close, because they've got terrible industrial problems over there too. But the major difference between these diets and Western countries in China is that the Chinese do not generally consume dairy products or meat from dairy animals, or they eat more fruit and vegetables and more beans, especially what? Oh, yeah. Now, if soybean was linked to increasing the chances of hormonal cancer, that statistic shouldn't exist. In fact, you look at all the Asian countries, they've got lower incidence of breast and demetrial prostate. Now, they eat the most soy in the world, okay? In many different ways. That's just one little statistic. Now, we've got to move on here because I'll have to go quick. Let's have a look at some foods. I'm particularly focusing on some cancer foods here that are, have been recognized to help with cancer. Because cancer is where we've got damaged cells, right? We've got a breakdown in the DNA and the replication of the cell and it's proliferating, it's growing and it can't stop. It's like a mortal. There are little chemicals in there that tell the cell, you must die now. It's your time to die. You know, you're three months old, bye-bye. You're three years old, bye-bye. We get another one coming. But this little thing switches it off and it just lives. It's like, I'm going to live and then I'm going to take over the whole body. That's how it works. So, in the plants, you have micronutrition called antioxidant. And it's pretty easy to understand. It just means it's chemicals that protect your body from being damaged. Protects the cell from mutating and causing cancer and other damaging diseases. They're in plant foods. You, get, you don't get them in animal foods at all. There might be a microscopic, tiny wee portion, hardly ever. In animal foods, you'll get antioxidants. If you want antioxidants, you've got to get them from plant foods, vegetable, fruit, legume, nuts, whole grains, seeds. All right? Why plant-based? Well, the database is our best knowledge. This database is to our best the no, is to our best knowledge the most comprehensive antioxidant food database published in so far. Is. It's a comprehensive database looking at all the antioxidant ability of every food. And plant-based foods introduce significantly more antioxidants to human diet than non-plant-based foods. I mean, you're talking, we're not just talking like this, we're talking like this, okay? You've got, you got meat down here, it might give you a six or seven reading, and you've got plants up here to give you 300 plus. Right? Big difference. So plant foods are well known to be the highest in antioxidants. Several studies on animals have demonstrated that dietary antioxidants can definitely increase life expectancy. We're just beginning to see human evidence. We do know now, oh sorry, what we do know now is that antioxidant nutrients reduce the risk of getting cancer, heart disease, and many diseases linked to aging, including cataracts, macular degeneration, arthritis. You remember, when we are eating a lot of foods which are just animal foods, white white flour-based foods and hardly having any vegetables and any fruits and any legumes and nuts and seeds in our diet. We're just supplying the body with foods that are going to create disease. And these plant-based foods are the foods that are going to protect us from disease. So when we think about going shopping, what should we think about first? Vegetables. Fruit, legumes, nuts, seeds, and then maybe I can put a wee tub of ice cream for dessert. No, this big. Are you, are you, I want you just to think about this. You go and look at shopping trolleys. I'm not asking you to judge anyone, but just look at them, observe. And you'll see what's in the shopping trolley of most people. Right? Two litre bottles of Coca Cola's, you may get four or five because they're on special. Buy four for five bucks, you know. You don't get broccoli ever that cheap, but you get go, go on. You know, white bread. You know, just, you just look at it and you get an idea. Look at your own trolley, look at your own fridge, your own cupboard, you get an idea. You know, the best thing to do is go to your local markets. I don't know if you have any around here, like your local markets where local people grow local food. And if you see on the side of the street, some people will have a little stall in their driveway selling their local produce. Stop and buy. That's where you're going to get organic food. That's where you're going to get food that's not destroyed by chemicals. That's the best food to get. Your local markets. And 
what we do, what I do, my wife and I, we go to this, uh, we buy boxes. So we, buy a, we might buy a box of apples, a box of bananas, a box of carrots. A, well, we buy half a box of avocados at the moment because they're so expensive. We might buy a box of, uh, what did I just buy? A box of mandarins and a box of tomatoes. Now, those five boxes cost me $138 last time. But they'll last us for a fortnight, and we will eat them in a fortnight. You know, when I, when I go to, this, when I go to this, this shop, and I walk to the supermarket, I say, wow, you got a function on? What, what's on the weekend? We must have a big function. I said, no, it's just for my three kids. And they're like, it's not registering that my three kids could eat five boxes of fruit and vegetables. I can guarantee you they eat them. I'll have to pay for them. So it just shows you, you see. But that, that's where you want to spend your money. And then we have to add whatever we've got to add after that. Okay? Alright. The best vegetables in the world, in my opinion, are cruciferous. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, bok choy, Brussels sprouts. I knew my mum made me eat them for a reason. They still have psychological damage from Brussels sprouts, you know. The cons- when I said that word, my, I twitched. <laughs> the consumption of cruciferous vegetables has been associated with a reduced risk of cancer of the lung, stomach, colon and rectum, which are leading killers in Australia. The health benefits of cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage and bok choy have been attributed to their high concentration of glucosinolates, the chemoprotective effect of indole 3 carbonyl. They have an ingredient there which has been proven to be anti-cancerogenic. Persons who eat four servings of broccoli per week have a 50% reduction in the risk of bowel cancer. That's just broccoli. Right? We're not talking about a transformation of diet. We're just talking about putting broccoli in there four times a week and we've already reduced the risk by 50%. What happens if I have it eight times in the week? Maybe I'm 100%. I don't know. See, the more you eat of these, the, the, we're talking about reducing the risk. What about beetroot? Do we like beetroot? Well, beetroot has been tested to be also anti-carcinogenic, anti-tumor promoting. Uh, looking at this, this was mice. It revealed a significant tumor inhibitory effect. The combined findings says that beetroot ingestion can be one of the most useful means to prevent cancer. It stopped the promotion and the growth of the tumor. In fact, I think I have a study here. Yes. 22 patients... They either had lung, stomach, colon, prostate, uterus, or skin cancer. Now, that's, that's a different, totally different cancers. Totally different reasons for that cancer. And yet, they were all given some raw, finely graded beetroot or a 300 ml beetroot juice every day. 21 of the 22 patients experienced improvements as defined as shrinking of the tumor, weight gain, and improved appetite. That's just one glass of beetroot juice. What if I have five? <laughs> you like garlic? Well, if you don't, you better start. It's very good for you. It kills everything. Garlic components have been found to block covalent binding of carcinogens to DNA. So garlic stops poisons getting attached to the cell. It enhances the breakdown of carcins, carcinogens. So poisons, it breaks them down, expels them from the body. has antioxidant, protects the body from... Uh, free radical damage. It regulates the cell proliferation. It helps the body regulate how it reproduces a new cell. It also regulates apostosis, that cell death. It tells the cell to die. By the way, you should be dead last week. And it induces it to die. And it also upgrades the immune response in the body. It regulates the immune response. We know that when we have a cold or a flu. What about mushroom? Whole mushroom extracts have been known to prevent in the treatment of cancer. There are many types of mushroom and, there, and nearly every one of them have anti-carcinogenic effect. Now I thought this was extraordinary and I, I, I tried to find out what cancer this was but I couldn't find out. Uh, the human study concluded that figs can shrink tumours by an average of 39% and can induce remission in 55% of cancer patients. Now I didn't find out what cancer this was. I'll try and find out later maybe. That's, a, that's pretty high, isn't it? I mean, you're talking you go into remission and 55%? That's one in two? 
And that's just the fruit. One fruit. It's just not, it's just not like changing your diet and life. This is just putting figs in here. Alright? Soya. Soya protein naturally contains isoflavin. Primarily genistein and diazidine, phytoestrogens which act like very weak estrogens or anti-estrogens. Now, let me explain this to you, the soy, because before I read this here. The soya bean contains phytoestrogen. Phyto is plant. It does not contain female estrogen. It contains plant estrogen. And it's not the only plant that contains that. There are other plants that contain that too. Because it does not contain female estrogen because female estrogen is made from cholesterol. And cholesterol is made from the liver. Or you eat it from an, eating an animal. And the soybean doesn't eat animals and it doesn't have a liver to make it. So it hasn't got female estrogen. But it does have plant estrogen. Now plant estrogen, phytoestrogen, it can mimic the estrogen activity of the woman's hormone. But it also can inhibit it. So it can promote and it can reduce. Does that make sense? Now I want you to know where it promotes and I want you to know where it reduces. In some tissues, soya acts as a mild pro-estrogen. That means it increases estrogen levels in the woman's body. Bone and the brain. Now I want you to think about this. Soya will increase your, a woman's estrogen level in her brain and her bones. Is that good or bad? It's very good. Because it also, it, estrogen regulates the bone density of a woman, especially postmenopausal. And it also regulates the mood of the brain, postmenopausal. Okay? It, it affects chemicals in the brain. So it's very good. Because you know, a woman will know when she's approaching her cycle and the, and the hormone levels of estrogen drop, what happens to the mind? Not every woman suffers this, but quite a lot. It creates an emotional imbalance. It affects serotonin in the brain. So, if you have... And menopause is like... It's like PMS over three years, unfortunately. That's what it's like. It's just, just like this until it goes down. <laughs> yeah, I don't regret being a man, I have to say. <laughs> oh, we have other problems, you see. Look at this. Since I was 25, not 55, 60, 25 I started losing it. I mean, they, they call it menopause for a woman because it's the pause of menstruation. I was like, why do they call it woman pause? Why a menopause for a woman? You know, it's to work around. For men, it's andropause. And it means testosterone levels go down and, and your biceps shrink. <laughs> oh, this hold it in. This gets a little bit firmer and more developed. And we lose a bit here. That's andropause. From 25, we just go like this. Well, just like a slow missile. For women, they just go up at puberty. They stay there and they go... <laughs> drop down straight away after a couple of years. Now, let's get back onto this subject here. So, the soy, the phytoestrogen in the soybean increases estrogen activity in the bone and the brain, which is good, while in others it acts as anti-estrogen in the breast and the uterus. So, actually, it inhibits estrogen promotion in the woman's breast and the uterus. Now, is that good or bad? It is very good. Because, remember, estrogen is a growth promoter. When a woman develops at puberty, it's the levels of estrogen that increase it to develop a breast and a uterus. That's estrogen that causes that. Once a man, when the lining is ready for conception, that's estrogen creates that. It's a growth promoter, isn't it? And so, do we want extra growth promotion in the breast once we have a breast? Do we want extra growth? No. If we have a uterus, do we want extra growth in there? No. So, the soybean inhibits that. It's beautiful for doing that. Okay. This just shows here, women with the highest take of isoflavin or those with the highest consumption of miso soup, which is from the soya, had approximately half the risk of breast cancer as women with the lowest intake. They reduced it by half, it's just having miso soup. Berries, they fight against cancer. They're very high in antioxidants. In fact, the berries are right up there on the top level of antioxidants. So you can't have enough berries. And all the berries, of course. Flaxseed. Flaxseed, not only is it very good on omega-3 oil, it is also good here. Uh, it inhibited the establishment of human breast cancer growth and metastasis. So 
So flaxseed inhibited the growth of the breast cancer and stopped it spreading to other tissue. Very good. Have we heard of turmeric? Those who like curry should probably like this one. And I have to tell you, there's some foods. Broccoli is up on the top pinnacle. I put turmeric up there with it. And the other one would be green tea. Now, that's, I'm talking about therapeutic effects, especially on cancer. Those are about the three highest products that have been examined in scientific journals to be anti-carcinogenic. Curcumin or turmeric is anti uh, carcinogenic, very strong. Its ability to induce apoptosis in different cancer cells indicates uh, using it as a treatment. And it is used in some cases, but it's still very, very poorly used in Western society. In Asian countries, they use it a lot more than we do. But it can induce the cancer cell to die. So it switches it off and dies. That's how powerful it is. It is also very anti inflammatory. Any inflammatory condition from arthritis or bowel or whatever's inflamed is very good for anti inflammatory. So it's been used in breast cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, all the cancers. Green tea has been used because it's very strong in antioxidant. Now, it does have caffeine in it, so I don't recommend it as a recreational drink. But I do recommend it as a therapeutic drink because it's got such powerful antioxidants in there that has been shown to reduce the tumour. Okay? So, when we look at optimal nutrition, let's summarise here because we're finished now. It's today's diet laced with chemicals and devoid of nutrients. Now, what nutrients is it devoid of? Micro, minerals, vitamins, antioxidants. As a result of food refining, it's now thought to be the greatest single contributor to what? Cancer. Conversely, by eating the right diet, you can cut your risk of cancer by up to 40%, says the World Cancer Research Fund, having reviewed over 5,000 studies linking the diet and cancer. Now, 40%, that's looking at, uh, the, that's looking at people who have uh, a generic vegetarian diet. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that these guys were healthy. They may have been vegetarian, they were a plant-based diet, but it doesn't mean to say they were a healthy plant-based diet. But even just being a plant-based diet, they reduced by 40%. But if it was a healthy plant-based diet, then that figure is going to go up. The reduction, dramatically, okay? Because if I'm living on, there's a difference between living on bread, pasta, and, I don't know, Coca-Cola, and broccoli, apple, nuts, legumes, lentils, and all that. Do you understand? There's a big difference. <coughs> For two decades, dietary advice to prevent cancer has emphasized fruit and vegetable consumption, and recent recommendations give the highest priority to consuming plant based diets. Such advice is entirely consistent with the recommendation of prevention from heart disease and cancer. Down here it says, on the basis of this evidence, researchers recently have estimated that plant-based diets prevent 20 to 50 percent of all cases of cancer. And remember, these studies are using just nominal, general plant-based diets, not healthy, healthy ones. Concerns about the rising cost of health care are being voiced nationwide, even as unhealthy lifestyles are contributing to the spread of obesity, diabetes, heart disease. For these reasons, physicians looking for cost-effective interventions to improve health outcomes and processed food. So the research is out there, more and more. <coughs> research shows that plant-based diets are cost-effective, low-risk interventions that may lower body mass index, blood pressure, blood sugar levels, cholesterol levels, so on. And physicians should consider recommending it. There's a lot of myths out there. There's a lot of, you know, Google is good in a way, but it's not good in another way. There's so much confusion because information overload. You don't know what to believe this guy or that guy or what guy. And even journals, even studies, even nutritionists, even naturopaths, you're going to get all different information from every person. And we've got to make up our own mind. All I'm, prevent, all I'm presenting you here is just information. And it's all facts. I ain't made it up. I don't, I'm not making broccoli healthy food by changing something. It's just that's the way it is, okay? Optimal health then. Just to wrap it up. Eat predominantly plant-based foods. Vegetable, fruit, then legumes, then whole grains, then nuts and seeds. Eat fresh or frozen as much as possible. 
So avoid the can. Eat it fresh or frozen. If it's not frozen, it's still preserved predominantly the nutrition in there. But if it's in bottles and in jars and cans and other types of food, it's pretty much lost a lot of it, especially its antioxidant properties. Eat raw as much as possible. So if you can eat it raw, I'm not saying you can't have apple pie, but if you can eat apple, I'll eat the apple, you know. So eat it raw if you can eat it raw. Don't cook everything because that's when you get the most nutrition. Eat organic as much as possible. I know it's not always possible because the price is always a, a factor as well. Eat moderate protein. I recommend about 20% protein in the diet. Eat low fat, about 15% in the diet. And eat complex carbohydrate, about 65% in the diet. Eat enough omega-3 and omega-9. Keep your low omega-6 and saturated fats down. Have low refined sugars and carbs. Low animal protein, whether it be meat or dairy. And make sure you never forget the last one. Variety, variety, variety. You know, because, you know, when clients come to me, I do a dietary evaluation. And it's potato, pea and carrot. Potato, pea and carrot. Potato, peas and carrot. Potato, peas and carrot. You know what I mean? It's wheat a big banana, wheat a big banana, wheat a big banana, wheat a big That's every breakfast, every dinner. It's chicken and mayo and salad wrap, chicken and mayo and salad wrap, chicken and mayo, or chicken and, and then it was cheese and ham, but then back to chicken and mayo and salad, chicken and mayo, you know. We only have a very short menu. You'd be surprised how short our menu is. Fill it up. When was the last time we had a pistachio? A Brazil nut, you know. Well, we might have an almond or a cashew or a peanut all the time. But when do we have those other ones? You know, when do we have bok choy the last time? When do we have Brussels sprouts the last time, you know? And we have apples and bananas and pears, but, you know, we've got to get a variety. And the best way to get a variety is go with the season. What's in season, eat it. Once it's out of season, I don't care if it comes from the other side of the world, because everything's in season all year round now in the shop, because it comes from everywhere. But look for what's in season here in Australia. Follow it. Right now, mandarins are in, eat mandarins. Grapes are still in a little bit. So whatever's in, eat it. And then it will be off. Go to the next one. That ensures throughout the year you're going to get variety. Okay, I've got to stop. Peter? I'm sorry, I went three minutes over time, but I think we started three minutes late. So I might have did it. Which is Actually, we're supposed to start the next program at three. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you very much, Alistair, for that information. And uh, you can talk to him afterwards. Uh, for more information. What we're going to do now, instead of starting the next program four minutes ago, we'll, start, uh, we'll have a little break uh, till quarter after. Uh, so during the break time, feel free to come here by the table here. There's a lot of books there uh, that they have there for sale. Take a look at some of the books, some information there. Uh, and then uh, let's be back here. We'll start promptly at uh, 3.15, okay? Is that fair enough? Thank you. And the restrooms are just outside, uh, just to the right there. Thank you.